I hope your day is full of turtles and armadillos and ant eaters and grasshoppers and lemurs and monkeys and ugh, I'm out of animals, baby. Zebras and rhinos and hippos. I love hippos. Guys, happy Wednesday. It is I, Shank, reporting live from Shanksville for another episode of Shank with the one, the only, comedian Diego Lopez. Before we get into this week's episode of Shank with Diego Lopez, there's just a few things I want to tell you about. First, I am coming to Brea Improv. That's right, Brea Improv 1221. Uh, That's this December. December 21st, 2022, Kim Congdon Kong and I are co-headlining. So if you're in Southern California, come out, support live comedy. And then I have more dates in LA at Princess Shank on Instagram and Twitter. I'm going to be at Jam in the Van this Friday. That's December 9th. I also have another set uh, next week. So look for, look out for me. I'm going to be in the LA area doing lots of sets. And then I'm going to be in Austin, Texas with Kim Congdon on January 6, 2023. We're doing a live This Bitch podcast and we're co-headlining at Vulcan Gas Co. And then we'll be on Kill Tony on January 9th. So start the new year off right. Come to the South, hang out with your girls. We love meeting our honeys. Um, And before we get into this week's episode of Shank, there's just something I want to tell you about, something that's making my holidays better, and that's oh yeah socks. Oh yeah. Socks are an incredible gift. Uh, No one has ever given me a pair of socks and I've said, oh, I'll never use these. Socks are something that you need. And what better gift than the gift of socks? They make great stocking stuffers. I love them. It's a great way to support your favorite show. Support the independent company that supports your independent podcast support oh yeah head over to oh yeah.com that's three o's h y e a h dot com discount code sarah 10 s a r a 10 for 10 percent off unique sock designs oh yeah collaborates with a ton of different artists to bring really cool unique designs whether you're into bob ross or mr rogers or aliens or pizza or donuts or sloths or dungeons and dragons there's a pair of socks for you what I love most about it is that you can personalize the gift based on the recep the recipient the recipient's interests say recipient once and see if you slaughter if not you're better than me but yeah so you can kind of curate the gift based on whatever the person's into so oh yeah has so many different socks and slippers to choose from they got skate socks surf not surf snow socks they got socks for everything sweetie Head over to ohyeah.com, discount code Sarah10. And then if you head over to my Instagram, you can see how I style them. I'm always posting in their socks. I love them so much. And I always give them out as gifts and people love them. So head over there. You can't go wrong with a pair of funky socks. Um, All right, guys, before we get into this week's episode of Shank with Diego Lopez, there's just one other thing I want to talk about. And that's this AI shit, Okay. This AI stuff, this Lenza stuff, you guys are seeing the good photos that Lenza made. You're not seeing the bad photos, okay? Lenza apparently thinks I'm a damn whore. They made my tits huge. I had like 10 photos with nipples. I'm going to show you some of them just so you can have a laugh before we get into this week's episode of Shank. Let's cut to the rejects from my Lenza. This is what nightmares are made of. Okay, some have like weird tit stuff going on. Others, I look disfigured and deformed. Okay, I don't know what this AI shit is. I don't know if we're giving our information to Russians or Germans or or China. I don't know what's happening. All I know is that Lenza did me dirty and I got the receipts to prove it. Okay, I bet some other people have some really bad Lenzas that they're not posting either. So... All right, now that you guys got to see that, let's get into this week's episode of Shank with the one, the only comedian, Diego Lopez. He's super funny. He's a great writer. He's also a black belt in MMA. So if you're in Brooklyn or New York and you're looking to train, check him out at Williamsburg MMA. Give him a follow on Twitter. Check out his podcast, A Little Time Pod. And let's get into this week's episode of Shank with the one, the only, Diego Lopez. Guys, here it is, everyone. Also, make sure to subscribe to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Sarah Weintink. Okay, let's get into this week's episode of Shank with Diego. Here it is. Hi, guys. 
guys. Welcome back to another episode of Shank. I'm Sarah Weinchank, and today's guest is comedian Diego Lopez. What's up, everybody? How are you? Hi. Hi. Thank Hi, you. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Oh my god, I love. I'm I love that fan. you're a I'm a big fan of the podcast. <laughs> thank you. I'm a big fan of you. Thank I'm you. I'm a fan of you as well. Conversations. Yeah. So uh, where should we start? What should we get into? What should we get into? I don't Diego know. Lopez. How do you feel about New York City? How, how, how do you like it so far? It's cold. <clears throat> you're visiting. It's very cold. Uh, I've been keeping it together. I've been getting around the city easily. Yeah, you did a good job. Shockingly. Because it's not the simplest uh, situation. Public transportation. The issue with with public transportation in New York, when again, when I first moved here in 2009, uh, was they don't tell you what direction the train is going in terms of northeast, south, or west, really. It just tells you what the last stop is, and you have to know where that is. But can I tell you something? Since oh. this is a safe space, Absolutely. I don't know where north, south, east, or west is just mm-hmm. right now, in general. Oh, Like, like if, if I had to guess... Oh, me neither. Me neither. You don't? No. Like, if I'm looking at this... I'm assuming that's west. See, I'm assuming that's north. <laughs> Who's to say? Who is to and say? And that's the fun thing about north, east, south. No one knows, really. <laughs> north, <laughs> south, But yeah. at least, it's not where I know I am, but I know where I'm going. So if yeah. I know if I if I go to the Bronx, I I know that from where I am in, in Bed Stuy right now, mm-hmm. that is east and or that's west and north. Right? I gotta go west and north. It's for me. It's the thought of going to do stand up in the cold. Uh huh. I don't. I'm not vibing with. You're that. not used to that. You're used to a much easier environment of L. A. Where it yeah. encourages everyone to yeah. go out and chase your dreams. Where New York is like, fuck you and fuck your dreams. I dare you to pursue your. And then you do if you if you really want it. Yeah, you have to want it a little more here. In New York, you got to want it a little bit more. I don't I'm, know if I would have made it if I started here. Hey, you didn't make it in L.A. either. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not one of those New Yorkers who are, who's like hates L.A. And like, no, I actually love L.A. You do? I love L.A. because I'm from Florida. So Similar L.A. is wedding. just a cool Florida. Yeah. So when yeah, I'm yeah, there, yeah, it feels yeah. very much at home. There's when palm I, trees. <laughs> it's funny to view L.A. as being a cool Florida. Well, yeah. There's more things to do. Yeah. There's less less types of lunatic, different types of lunatic. Different type of lunatic. An How would you compare lunatic them? lunatic is, is in LA. An entertaining lunatic that's had work done. Yes. I feel like everyone in LA's had work done. Yeah. In New York, you'll see an original nose. Absolutely. He, in LA? Big fan of authenticity here. In LA, yeah. you don't. No. You see second... Uh, a second pass at yeah. a nose. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. look, by all means, no judgment. It's just interesting. But I think the only plastic surgery I look down on is ab implants. Ab implants? Yeah, I think if you want a new nose, go ahead. That's absolutely cool. I get trying to pursue a body image that you've uh, wanted. Am I leaning too far back? No. You're good? Am I, am I leaning like the, too far forward? Here, I'll pull this a little bit just because I don't want the headphones to pull the... Okay, there okay. There you go. Um... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, no. I feel like, what about a calf implant? That's fine. You, I don't think a lot of people have had, that one guy from True Life on MTV fucking 25 years ago got calf implants. And is that everyone, where I saw it? Yeah, yeah. So it was it was MTV, I'm getting plastic surgery. And it was like one person was getting a breast reduction and then the guy was getting calf implants. And it was a big deal to make fun of him. Calf implants? It's like, why don't you just work out? Calves are an interesting muscle to develop, if I'm Let, being honest. Let's get involved. Let's Absolutely. find out why. <laughs> I'm a fitness guy. I work you out are. a lot. Yeah, you're Everyone a fitness knows guy. That. Uh, you're a black belt. I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a different type of fitness. It's a fitness of the discipline and then the mind. Um, but the calves, some people like just can't. Like it's weird. Like John Jones is a fighter. Like he it's made fun of a lot for having very skinny legs. It's like it's just his physiology. Some people just can't develop calves as much. It can get bigger, but there's like a there's like a a ceiling to it for everyone. But it would be a turnoff for me. Which would if be? if a guy went out and got calf implants. Why would it be a turnoff? I agree. I don't just, know. I want I don't you to know. vocalize it. I don't know. I think it would just be like, Is it an insecurity thing that you're like, oh, you're insecure about this. That's unattractive. Yeah. And also just do you really need calves that badly? Mm. Okay. But I guess if the situation was reversed and I got new tits and someone yeah. I wouldn't like it if that if somebody was turned off by that, by, turned off by my hard, perfect tits, mm-hmm. well, <laughs> hard, it, perfect, it, fake titties. Yeah. It, it's, 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 uh, it's very normal to reverse roles and think about would fairness work in this way, but it's unfair to reverse roles because male to female, the, 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 the 
history and the, the social norms are different. Right. So it is more, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's not, it's not a perfect um, kind of flip. It doesn't make the most amount of sense. So when a, when a, per, when a man, a straight man gets plastic surgery, it all, a lot of times is unattractive to a woman in the, in the way of like, no, you're a guy. You should be confident in whatever you have. And that's because good. society accepts you guys no matter what. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you have a big nose, but you're a funny guy. Yeah. In LA, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have any of their original body parts. I mean, <laughs> the lip situation in LA is out of control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of filler. And again, a lot of filler. Freak what you feel. Yeah. Freak what you feel. Yeah. If you want to get filler, I think it looks funny sometimes. It looks insane. When it looks I, blow up dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I could see it like under your nose is also like lifting like a. Did you kiss a puffer fish? What are you doing? It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, no. But, you know, I have tattoos. That's that's basically a version of, of, of not plastic surgery, but it is I'm modifying my body to fit an aesthetic that I am pursuing. Yeah. And my pursuit is bad boy. Yeah, he's a bad boy. <clears throat> not a nice guy. Um, but so all of your tattoos are in one style except for one tattoo. Most of my tattoos are in one style. Yeah. All American but visible. Classic. American traditional. Oh, I, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. It's okay. I used to call it classic traditional. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, all my visible tattoos are American traditional. So when I, we were talking about this before, uh, when I moved to New York, I, uh, I started getting tattoos in South Florida at this shop called Color, Flat, Color Fast. Mm -hmm. And the artist who was tattooing me moved to New York basically the same time I did. And he was working under a tattooer from South Florida who was here and was well established and was already, back then was already kind of famous in tattooing. And we hung, uh, uh, my friend and I from South Florida, we got lunch and he goes, oh, do you need a job? We're looking for a shop guy. And if you don't know, a shop guy in tattooing is basically someone who's there to do all the menial tasks. I answer the phone, I pick up their food, I deal with appointments, I clean the tubes, I set up breakdown stations. What do you station. mean clean the tubes? Guide me through the tube cleaning so, process. A, a, a tattoo machine is three. It's two parts. Well, three parts, technically. Okay. It's the thing they're holding, which is the tube. Okay. The machine, which is the electronic pulsing thing. Okay. And the needle. Okay. Um, So the tube part, that gets removed, and if it's steel, those get cleaned, like in a hospital. Like, they have to get right. sterilized. Now, a lot of times, people use plastic ones and just throw them away, which... Saves the shop guy a lot of time and effort. The back when I was doing it, I had to go in a room and scrub and clean up 70 no, tubes. No. And, you know, you put them in a, I can't remember what the move, the, it's been a long time. I can't remember what the machine is called, but it's like a sterilizing machine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you do that kind of stuff. You, you, you answer phones, you go get their food, you walk their dog. Like you're basically their bitch to a degree. You're like the intern of the tattoo to a shop. Degree. A lot what's the thing? A lot of times shop guys or shop girls are people that are going to apprentice. And they want to learn how to do yeah. it. So they get treated poorly as part of like a, a, a initiation. A process. But I was just the guy who needed a job and they started trying to treat me wrong. I'm like, hey, no, no, no. I'm not learning. I'm here just to clean a guy. The yeah. It's like if, if you walked into like a fraternity and they're hazing the maid. It's like that's just so not funny. <laughs> what she's here for, man. Um, Wait, okay. So, did you see anything crazy when you were working at the tattoo shop? Did I see anything crazy? I mean, like weirdos. Yeah. So, so the shop I worked at, which was called Smith Street, which is now pretty famous mm -hmm. in in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn. Burt Crack was my boss, and he's he and I are from the same place in South Florida, Lauder Hill. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um. He was, again, it was already like a very well-established shop. It was like a very cool shop. So like we didn't get a lot of um, walk-ups, like a lot of appointments that were there specifically for them. Sometimes people would wander in not knowing what the shop was and like ask for like really bad ideas. Like, what's a bad one? Like I remember one time, because Bert had two shops. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had Smith Street and he also had one in Queens called Top Shelf, mm -hmm. which I worked at as well. And that was much, much more of a street shop. Like, it was mostly walk-ins. And I remember one time, because Bert was a pirate in the way that, like, he was good enough that he didn't have to do whatever he didn't want with tattoos. Right. He's like, no, I could say no to things. That's and like when you're a good comic and you can turn you down can turn stage. down, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, actually, I will not be performing in the back of a bar. I'm above this. Yeah. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've earned my way to say no to this. So, uh, one time a, a, a young lady was at the, the, the shop and she like, had a drawing. And she's like, I want a bird. And Bert's like, I don't want to do that kind of bird. <laughs> was it ugly? It wasn't that as ugly. It's like she wanted like a very like, you know, when someone draws with a pencil, they do like a million lines and like make yeah. it very flowy. 
And he's like, that's not going to look good as a tattoo. And she goes, I want it to look like a sketch. And he goes, it's going to look sketchy. <laughs> because we don't understand about looking at an image on a piece of paper and then trying to transfer it to skin. Mm-hmm. Is skin, it doesn't work like paper. Mm-hmm. Skin grows and shrinks and moves. So like, uh, if a line is too fine, it kind of disappears. If ink isn't held in by black outline, it kind of like grows and, and smudges out. And um, so he was just really good at being like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, so it's mostly just bad imagery or bad um, concept, conceptual uh, ideas that people would have to say no to. People would come in drunk. I had to kick some people out once. I almost got in a fight once, but it was pretty cool. Have you ever gotten a tattoo um, when you were drinking? Um, my fur I haven't had a, I haven't drank in 14 years, um, but my first couple I was drinking at that time. But I know that when you drink and you get tattooed, it thins your blood, so you You're just bleed spo- more. Yeah. So I'm like, I'll just I'll just take I just won't get drunk. It's fine, no big deal. I got but drunk. I got drunk at a block party. No, on the I was sober for that one. Oh, no, on the I have a bow on my neck. Oh, okay. I got it at a street fair. It's not a good sign when you're getting tattoos in the street. <laughs> no, you're getting tattooed next to a barbecue pit. Yeah, no. That's not a good sign. No, yeah. I, I picked it off of, you know how they have... Flash? Yeah. I love Flash. Here's the thing. You do? Yeah, so there was... Miami Ink kind of changed the, the game a little bit because Miami Ink is a TV show. It made people romanticize the idea of having very original ideas for tattoos and very meaningful ideas for tattoos, which isn't bad inherently, mm-hmm. but it made everyone think that every tattoo had to be this like... It means something. Like seven people died on a boat and then I was hit by the boat and then I got this butterfly. It's like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is fine, but not every tattoo has to be that. Tattoos in, in, you know, in the American style were you were in the navy and you stopped at a p- at a port for the night and you go get drunk with your friends and you walk into the tattoo shop and you go that that's fine i want this anchor it's gonna take you 25 minutes and i'll never see you again and there's something nice about that i love that style of tattooing but you know as someone who got a tattoo at skank fest on a whim <laughs> i'll uh-huh. say <laughs> i don't recommend it i'm sure. gonna go ahead and say i don't recommend doing it on a whim I don't recommend getting a tattoo on a whim, not in a tattoo shop. Not in a tattoo shop. That There's a line there. And then you got, like, if when I get tattooed, which is rare nowadays, I don't get tattooed very often. I go to my old boss. What would be a reason for you to get tattooed? I have money. Yeah. That's yeah. truly it. I have money yeah, in a spot that's bothering me. This spot's bothering me. I want to fill this. Um, mm-hmm. But I will go fill it soon. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to text Bert. Uh And tell him to put me in the books for this day. Uh And he will. Uh And I'll show up with donuts for him and the gang because they're all friends of mine. And I'll be like, I have this space. What do you want to do with it? See, I like that. I like leaving it up to the tattoo artist. And he'll suggest and he'll be like, I think this would fit nice. And go, great. I might give him some parameters. I just have a lot of heads. Like I have a lot of animal heads now. Yeah, you do have a lot of animal heads. How many things can I get? You know, like. Why did you choose the animal heads? Um, Were you just like, I, I mean, one them? and tell me which one you want me to tell you why. I mean, what's this one? That is a, uh, sh- you can't see it. It's, um, so it's a, an adjustment to a Rosie Flash. Rosie was old tattoo artist. Uh huh. Like, like 40s and 30s and shit. It was a, like a, a lion. Uh huh. And I had him redraw it a little bit and made it a hyena. From a lion to a hyena. Yeah, because I like hyenas because they're funny and dangerous. I like that. So it has like some dotting, some spotting, and it has like the the hairs on the neck. So it's like, if you know about tattoos, you know what this is a very like iconic, Im- iconic imagery. Uh huh. And it just changed a little bit. Like I have um, this cowboy skull, which we uh, we saw the Jonah Hill documentary. It was so good. Jonah Hill. Yeah. Got get tattooed by my old boss. Really? Yeah. We have the same tattoo in the same spot. Really? Yeah. This exact cowboy skull. This is a very old imagery. It's very old. Um, the person who did this was Jeff Whitehead, who was like a very famous... He did it while we were, he was working at the shop and he did it in Birch chair. Um, so like on the surface, you just look at it and you go, okay, it's a cowboy skull. And then you look at it a little bit longer and you start seeing things that are signatures of that artist. Like what? The, 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 the sharp teeth, the weird nose, the, 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 the type of shading. Like it's just like, if you know, you know, kind of a thing. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. 
Um, so I, I love I love American traditional. Well, are there any tattoos that you don't like on my body? Yeah, yeah, the big one on my ribs. Yeah, it was my second tattoo. It it seems like that would have taken a long. It time. took fourteen hours. Did you sit there no, the whole no, fucking no, no, no. time? It took fourteen hours in like four to five hour increments. It's brutal. I hate it. I don't even really see it anymore. Like my brain has done the thing where it makes me blind to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm embarrassed by it when I take my shirt off. You are. Yeah, because it's a thing. It's not poorly done. No, it's a whole scene though. It just doesn't fit the aesthetic of the rest of my tattoos. It's like a, a, an alien underwater. Yeah, it's if you want to look at. I'm not going to show you my. I'm not lifting my you're not, shirt on the you're podcast. You're not doing it. I'm not being that guy. It's a Why? Jeff Soto painting. If you know who that is, it's a robot smiling, th- pushing out pink goo. <laughs> uh, it's wild, but it's yeah. It's like it just doesn't fit the aesthetic. It doesn't fit the aesthetic. Um, it's all no big deal. Okay, so I have a lot of guy listeners, so. I feel fellas. like fellas, fellas, yeah, they're going to want to know, can we give them some tips hmm. like on hygiene, on how to get dressed, like the basic okay. stuff, Sure. because a lot of guys don't know. Yeah. A lot of guys don't know because I've noticed this with how men and, and well, boys and girls are raised because I, I, I teach mixed martial arts. So mm-hmm. I teach kids mm-hmm. and I've over the, I've been teaching for a long time. I, I've seen how, how uh, 10 years I've been teaching. Okay. I've seen how. The difference is in how uh, parents talk to boys and talk to girls. In what way? In in the way that like uh, the tone changes and the the directions kind of change and the intensity of how they give them like advice changes. So are they m- more rude with their sons? Not that they're more rude, but they're just a little bit harder on them. I could see, and that. it's more like stop behaving this way. Where girls is like encouraging to behave a, a different way, uh huh. Um, which I don't think I necessarily think is right or wrong. I just think you need a little bit of both. Um, so with 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 men, like when you become a teenager, yeah, it's really on you to figure out how to dress and how to take care of yourself. Uh, where girls have a little bit more uh, guidance. And that guidance, unfortunately, is because of negative social norms that have been pushed upon women. You got to look good. You got to smell good. You got to shave your legs. Like all these things are kind of that are inherently negative because it's all about judging your your body, um, but do make you nice to be around smell wise. Right. Where men were like, hey, you're supposed to kind of smell bad. Yeah, and, and there's a there, again. You're a man. Yeah, there's a Why layer. Why would you smell good? Yeah, there's a layer to that that I think is is useful. Like if I smell bad. Because I've been working out, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If I smell bad because I didn't shower and I've been sitting on the couch, that's not good. Um, (laughs) So I would say for for men, top, I'll give you top three. Top three. Top three things you can do to yourself, do for yourself today. Oh, I like the urgency. The urgency with the I'm all about urgency. We gotta go, fellas. We're running out of time. Um, Get pussy today. (laughs) Yeah, it's my self-help book. I'm (laughs) I'm reading it like, fuck, what do I do? Um... Number one, figure out what pant size you really are. It's kind of like a great note. It's in the same way how a lot of women are wearing the wrong bra size. Mm -hmm. A lot of men are wearing the wrong pant size because it seems like men forget that there's two sizes with pants. There's your waist and there's your inseam. Mm -hmm. So guys just get pants that are the right right waist and they just roll those suckers up until they fit Mm -hmm. or they, they, they get stuck with a number that they were in high school. Or to five years ago. Women do that shit too. Yeah. Look, I'm an extra small. It's like, bitch, in what mm. world are you an extra <laughs> yeah. small? Mm. <laughs> At Torrid? <laughs> uh, so f- go to a tailor. Go to a tailor and just have me like, hey, what fucking size pants am I? And they'll tell you. Oh, that's They'll good. tell you what size pants you are really quickly. Well, it does, they don't look at you, you probably. They'll measure you probably. Um, I know that I'm a 30-30. I know that. So I can You've order. Been measured. I've been measured and I know exactly how I like my pants to fit me again because some, uh, it's called a break mm-hmm. when you get suit pants, how you want the the leg of the pants to sit on your shoes. Do you want them to touch, not touch or very much touch and how much the pant like cuffs or, or bends at the shin. Mm-hmm. That's called a break. Mm-hmm. I know I like a break. So, that, so I know when I buy pants, I have to buy 3031 so I can cuff it or, you know, it, it's in, important to know what fits you really. 
Uh, also, same thing. Same thing can be said about shirts. I feel like a lot of guys wear the wrong size shirt. A lot of guys wear it's it unbelievable. too small of a shirt. It's and chaos. It's, and it looks bad. It's like just size up, and it will look so much better. Yeah. And I think as people get in, in their heads about, oh, I want to be this size. Yeah, it's like yeah, cut the size out. Yeah. No one cares. The, the if if you wear a small and you shouldn't be, it looks terrible. So it doesn't matter that your brain's like, it's a small. That's great. Now you look like a stuffed sausage. You look terrible. So you fit something, something <laughs> well fitting. I'm not saying expensive. No, I'm not saying it has to be a fucking beautiful Oxford. It just can be a t-shirt if it fits well. Like if you get a pair of classic blue jeans and a white fitting, well, a well fitting white t-shirt, you look amazing. That's true. It's a great fit. That is true. Um, so that'd be my advice. Know what size you really are. That's number one. Okay. Number two, you need to moisturize. You need to moisturize your face. <laughs> That's you moisturize a good note. your body. That's a good note. Yeah. Make sure you're using a uh, a nice face wash. And I don't mean nice in like very expensive. I just mean nice in a, a good quality. Don't fucking use that apricot scrub. It's going to ruin your skin. The apricot get scrub from the 90s. Yeah. That's, get a mild. Get something like CeraVe. I really like. CeraVe is a you great one. You can get a Dwayne Reed. It's nothing fancy, but it's good. Um Get that and then get a nice moisturizer, something with an SPF. Take care of your skin. Um, GQ. Uh-huh. I'm a big fan of this. GQ does a thing called the the Best Stuff Box. Ooh. And it's a quarterly box that they mail to you if okay. you subscribe to it. And it has $200 or more worth of items for 50 bucks. Do you do this? I do it. I and, love it. And what comes in there? I'll Walk get, us through, yeah. Diego. Paint you'll, a picture. What's coming I'll in think the of box? The, the, you'll get like uh, sunglasses, nice socks, maybe a beanie. Whoa. You'll also get um, skincare stuff. Like you'll get a, a moisturizer that they're trying out. And you'll get maybe a body wash. You'll get um, eye serum. You can get a deck of playing cards that they think are cool. Like just cool things. And I think like if you have a if you're if you're a woman listening to this uh -huh. and you have a man in your life who you know you're gonna be with for more than a year at least, <laughs> this is a phenomenal gift. Yeah, that is like, a good Here, gift. Here's some suggestions you could try these things and fucking change your like change your life. Change your shit around. Bro. You could <laughs> it's unfortunately it's so funny to me how easy it is for men to really like rise above the pack, like yeah. pass every other guy. Like just, just a little, little effort. A little effort. Okay, so those so, are the first two. Yeah, moisturize and a good face wash uh, and a sunblock. Um, and number three is have a scent. Have a signature scent for yourself. Have a scent. I like this. I like Alec Baldwin's method. What is Alec Baldwin's he, method? Uh, he kills the person using the perfume. <laughs> no, his method is he has a summer fragrance and a winter fragrance. And I think that's Wait, a, great, what? a great way to live your life as a man. Wait, he switches it up based on the season? I think it's brilliant. Do you do that? I do. In the summer, I buy... Uh, uh, I really like... I love You notice this. I love Aesop. Yes. Aesop makes really beautiful quality products. I also like Mal and Getz, which is like a level down in terms of price. Um, they make a lot of uh, unisex scents. Mm -hmm. I like perfumes. Uh, colognes are always, I don't know, I think, I think it, a lot of times they're too like intense. Well, and when you say a scent, we're not talking acts. No, 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 no. I don't think anybody thinks that anymore. Well, I, I don't know though. You never know. Okay, my apologies. Because I have some bros listening. Fellas, no, judge, <laughs> no judgment. I understand why space. you're doing it. It's a safe space. No judgment. But throw that shit in the trash. You're, you're, you're better than that. If you're in your 30s, if I can, late 20s even, get the fuck, get rid of that. Um, acts and Febreze. Yeah. That's Wash no, your clothes. No way, no. Um, so I like... Uh, Aesop has a bunch of fragrances. They have a, I think it's called Rosu, which Ooh. is a little more floral, which I'll do in the summer. And then in the winter, uh, I really like, there's a brand called Boy Smells. And mm -hmm. they are no, they got known for candles. Yeah, I've seen them. Uh, I use uh, their perfume and the candle. I have both of the same scent. Hinoki Fantone. Ooh. It's it's i think it's my favorite fragrance of all time Ooh. it's unbelievably good um so have a signature scent don't overdo it one spray walk into it i could i have a tendency to overdo a scent you have a tendency it's it's hard not to especially if you like it you're like i want to smell amazing yeah, and then yeah, people and then just leave the volume like yeah i've been on the train with like 
guys where they walk by and you're like, I I think I'm high. I think <laughs> yeah. I'm fucking pass out. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's high intense. from the fragrance. Uh, so how long have you been doing jujitsu? Let's mm. let's get into the okay. So some MMA stuff here. When I no, it's good. So I moved to New York in 2009. Okay. My best friend at the time, Chris, shout out to Chris, was living here, and I came to visit him, and I, I'm like, oh fuck it, I should be living. This is rad. I'll live here. Uh, and I moved here, and uh, he was my only friend here, and then he suggested I go try this kickboxing thing up the street that a couple of his friends are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did. And I walked in and they're doing jujitsu that day. And I'm like, I don't know much about this. I knew a little bit because the bouncer at my old bar that I used to drink at, he was, uh, he got on the ultimate fighter, which is like a reality show for the UFC. Okay. So I knew about it a little bit, but I'm like, I'll try it. And I liked it cause it was confusing and weird. And there's something um, very primitive about rolling around with someone. Like it's, it scratches a part of your monkey brain. Like, mm-hmm. ooh, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so I liked it. And I signed up for it. And uh, I was going. And I'm like, this is kind of fun. And then I was working a lot at the tattoo shop. So I had to step away from jujitsu for about six months. And then I quit the tattoo shop. And I came back to jujitsu. And I was like, better. Like I had, a, like I noticed a step up in skill which was weird because I took a step away from it. And then I really started loving it. And then I... And what, do you, what did you love about it? What do you love about it? I love that... Because when I look at it, mm-hmm. I go, that seems dirty. Yeah. It's I go, <laughs> rolling around. It's stinky and filthy. Yeah. What I love about it is that it's on the surface and it's, it's violent, it's intense, mm-hmm. it's athletic, it's uh, rough... But as you get better at it, you start understanding the problem-solving aspect of it. And you start understanding the self-expressionary aspect of it, where uh, the way you roll, which is sparring on the ground, it says a lot about how who you are as a person. I, if you get good enough. Interesting. Yeah. I've rolled with people who don't speak English, mm-hmm. and I get a good grasp of the type of person they are based on how they roll. What do you mean? Like if they're if they're so a dirty roller, no, or you're yeah, like you're, you're an a asshole. bad person. Yeah, you're a piece of shit. No, so I'll give you an example. Um, there's a a guy who I trained for a long time. His name was Mark. Uh-huh. He and I got our black belts the exact same day. Mm-hmm. Um, he works in like finance. He wears a suit and tie. He's married. He has a house. He's very responsible. Mm-hmm. And his jujitsu is like that. What he's mean? very conservative. He's like paying his taxes. Yeah. While he's... <laughs> he pulls out a calculator. He's a calculator is a geek. No, he's just very conservative. He's very meth- methodical. Uh-huh. Very cerebral when he rolls. It's very slow, small movements. No risk. Small, small movements. Um, I am not that as a person. I am wild and risky and fun-loving. And I... Uh, want to see if I can get myself out of bad positions, and I want to f- like I want to fuck myself. Like I want to see if I'm good enough to survive. So I just throw myself into bad positions, just for to, for the high of getting out of them. Yeah, I always want to to check my skill level. I always want to make sure that I'm as good as I want to be. So we're very different, but we're both black belts. Uh huh. So it's That's like it, it's just how you express yourself. A different style, kind yeah. of like comedy. Very much so. Um. And it's it's really fun when you get to feel yourself inside someone's mind. And I can be doing something and go, they're going to do this. When they do that, I'm going to do this thing and they're going to fall into this trap. And like clockwork. I so you're push. one step ahead of them. You're, you're one about. to two steps ahead of them on average. It depends how good they are. If, if you're if you're much better than them, you can't go too far ahead of them because they're not good enough to follow you. If you're about the same skill, you're like you're both just going tit for tat fast. So is that fun? Is it more fun to roll with both. someone who's the same skill level as you? To a degree, because it's like it gets to like you get to go at a fi- faster pace. Right. It's fun to roll with someone who's less skilled than you because then you get to sh- teach someone while you're fighting them. And the analogy I use for because I teach the analogy I use for for a lot of the students who are starting off when they start, you know, part of your ego is like I want to do well. Mm-hmm. I want to show them, my instructor that I'm good at this. And mm-hmm. you're not though. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're just protecting yourself with your or like st- physical strength too uh-huh. much. So the analogy I tell them is like, look, you're coming to my house for my house party. Okay. I know everyone. Let me introduce you to them. Why are you standing at the door not letting me introduce you to people? I want you to know these things. 
I want you to That's understand. That's a good analogy. These That's a great yeah, analogy. Thank you so much. I'm really good at teaching. <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, love teaching? I do. I really love teaching. Like what I, about it? I fought. Mm-hmm. I, I was an MMA fighter. I fought competitively, and I only did it so that a I knew what it felt like. I was scared of it, and b I wanted to make sure that when I was teaching, I could be like, "Look, I've been in a cage. I know what it feels like." I How many times have you been like. in a cage? I did six, six or seven fights. So when you say in a cage, yeah, like you've you seen mean yours. that, yeah, that like an octagon, thing. <laughs> that octagon yeah, thing. Yeah, okay, yeah, I find yeah. one of those. Yeah, um, I love teaching because I like being able to take a a. a a theory or a concept and filter it through my experience and simplify that experience and get it to another person fast. I want everyone to be better than I am, faster than it was for me. That's cool. So uh, I really love being able to explain something and watch someone's face go like, oh, okay. I get it. I get it. It's fun. I love that feeling. I taught when I, when I played hockey as a teenager. I coached a kid's team. Uh-huh. That was my first teaching exercise experience. And I really loved being able to like, I would realize how much of my, because when I, when I get good at something or want to get good at something, I become very obsessive. Are you like that with comedy? I'm like that with everything. And I uh, like I sit. Like that. I like lo- that too. You like that too? Yeah. yeah. It's great. To a degree. Uh, <laughs> I sit and think and think and think and try to figure out ways I can be good at very specific things, not realizing that I'm just compiling teaching lessons. That makes sense. Because I taught it to myself to a degree. I forced myself to implement uh, an exercise to gain a skill, not realizing that I could just hand that to someone else as well. Um, so teaching, it's very fun guiding people to rooms. So do you think all women should take a... A jujitsu class? Yes, I do. You do? I really do. It's and again, okay. So, because I, I have people come to the gym a lot, and women come to our gym, and I'm very proud of our gym that we have a lot, of, quite a few women. It's a very good vibe. The name of your gym is Williamsburg MMA in Brooklyn, New York. If you're in Brooklyn, MMA, if you're in some. New York, yeah, um, come get some. Uh, come get some. So a lot of times, yeah, women are like, "Oh, I want to do self defense," and they'll come do a striking class. Okay, boxing, like Muay thai? kickboxing, yeah, yeah, Muay Thai, um, which is cool but if you're a woman it's very unlikely even for men if i'm being honest it's very unlikely for you to develop the speed power power and confidence in striking to actually be able to defend yourself well okay okay uh whereas in brazilian jiu-jitsu where the whole idea the whole idea is for the weaker person to beat the bigger person. So jujitsu is made for women, essentially. Yes. <laughs> it was developed by a sickly 135 year old man, 135 pound man. Oh. So like it's it, it's engineered. He was sickly. Yeah, he had like about a like a lot of like uh, Helio Gracie how like notoriously sick and had like a lot of illnesses as a teen. Um, oh. I don't know which ones. Couldn't so, care. <laughs> some real old. He's an old bitch, but <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I'm always, I, I understand why women don't want to jump into jiu-jitsu because it's unbelievably intimate. Yeah. Close just, guard is basically missionary. Yeah. Mount is being on top, you know, like. Yeah, I feel like it would just make me horny too. It would. Um, does it make you horny when no, you're rolling with people? <laughs> no. I'm very, it, my mind clicks over. I'm like a doctor. But. It's very intimate and fucking weird. And I get why women wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. I've done a lot of privates with women. Mm-hmm. And it's like, look, it's just us. It's safe. You know that this is n- nothing weird. So you, you, they feel a lot safer. But you had, I kind of have to overcome that. Because uh, if a man that you don't know is attacking you, you don't want to be new to that feeling. To be so overwhelmed by that feeling of discomfort and fear that you can't think critically and, and actually be able to defend yourself. Okay, so like, what's a move? <laughs> what's a move what's a move i could do on someone if i had to what's one move? move okay okay um take them in the balls no i would okay so i when i teach women when i do one-on-ones i work from extremes okay and then work our way backwards so a lot of times i'll just put them on the floor and I sit on top of them no in, in what's called mountain <laughs> position holding them down basically uh-huh. and i'm like get out and they can't they have no idea how to get out right yeah. You have no idea what to yeah, do. Yeah, no, I wouldn't know what to do either. So, so then if, I, a, if a grown man just yeah, sat on me, yeah. so then I'd I, be like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I, I first alert them to their ignorance. And go, look, you can't, I'm not even fighting you. 
I'm not resisting necessarily. I'm not resisting with any strength or speed. I'm just sitting here and you can't get me off of you. Imagine if I was hitting you. Imagine if you were afraid. Like that's fucking terrifying. That is scary. So I walk them through it. Okay, put your knee in my hip, make my hands fall to the floor. Boom, great. Isolate one of my hands with both of your arms and hug it close to your chest. Boom, done. I am now isolated and easily to fall. I'm easy to fall over towards that direction. Lift your hips with your feet and rotate in that direction. And all of a sudden, you're on top. Oh. So. You make it seem so uh, straightforward, so matter of fact. But I feel like if I, if you're in that position and you're scared. The, the, this is the, the beauty of, of what jiu-jitsu does. So if, we're, if you do a kickboxing class, yeah. you're hitting pads, right? Mm-hmm. That's not turning on your fight or flight. That's not getting you used to feel being in that, that emotional space. With jiu-jitsu, you're going full gear. You're fully rolling with someone hard. You're, you're holding them down. The whole, so you're getting more comfortable with being in that emotional space. Not that it's as extreme as it will be in the street, but it's a step in the right direction. How long until you get a cauliflower ear? Uh, depends on the person. It depends on your <laughs> How long anatomy. until you got a cauliflower ear? It happened pretty soon. And were you excited? I was absolutely very You're excited. You're like, hell yeah. It's a badge of honor, in my opinion. Um, I'm very lo- I'm very glad that I had a friend who, he's like, because you can drain it to get rid of it. And my friend's like, look, I know you're excited about getting cauliflower. Just drain it a couple times. Just get rid of it. And a if you keep getting bit. it, then, because. So then what you're if, meant to have yeah, it. Yeah, so what, what if you don't know, uh. Does your it ear, hurt? Not anymore. It does when it, it feels like a toothache when you first get it. Oh, uh, like it's just tender and soft and, and no. Parents. Your ear is cartilage. An earache. When, when you kind of when you do jujitsu and you're like using your head and you're pushing and people are pushing their their chest into you, the cartilage will crack, ah. and then it fills with blood and pus, or not pus but liquid. <gasps> and uh, if you leave it alone, that that liquid will harden. And it will become cauliflower. Why? It becomes cauliflower so your ear moves less and it's less likely to be ripped off. So it's protective. Yeah. So like if you flick your ear, your ear is very soft and yeah. it moves a lot. Yeah. Flick, move my ear. It doesn't move that much. It doesn't move very much. It's it's much more protected now. It's a callus basically for my Do you ear. think it prevents people from fucking with you? Do you ever show off your ear? No, I don't. Uh, uh, like, <laughs> hey man, easy. <laughs> no. Slow down, dude. I think people don't... F- I've had people fuck with me on the train and like try to get in a fight with me and it's very funny to me. Uh, but I think it's more my like eye contact. Like I can, I'll can, i stare down your soul. I'm not afraid of you. Yeah, And yeah, that's yeah. intimidating when someone that really looks scary. at you. Because I can just sit there and go... That is scary. And then they'll look away because they're cowards. Yeah. Because they haven't tested themselves in the same way I have. Right. I'm not tough. I'm just not a coward anymore. I'm it's not different. tough. I'm just not a coward. Anymore. I'm not. I I've gotten the shit kicked out of me by people that are millionaires at getting the shit, uh, kicking the shit out of people. I'm and very good at being, getting my ass beat. And does it make you? Does it humble you after you get Absolutely. your ass beat? What, what's the feeling of? How do you feel after you get your ass beat versus beating someone else's ass? Um. Okay. So when I'm beating somebody up, it's most likely a student. I don't spar with strangers anymore. Like kick, like MMA full sparring. I just spar with the people at my gym who I'm trying to make better. So when I beat them up, I'm not really hitting them. Right. Not I'm, I'm not the power I could be hitting them. Right. But some days are you're like, I wish I could really go for it. Sometimes, yeah, because I, I want to get tested in that way too. Right. Um. So when I ta- spar my students, I beat them up and they feel like they got beat up, but it's more my intensity and that I'm bullying them with my defense. Mm-hmm. So I'm just in their face the whole time and they can't hit me hard enough to stop me. Okay. In the beginning, you get hit and you're like, you you will cower because you're very unused to that snapping, fucking someone flick the lights off feeling. As you get good, I'm very good at getting punched in the face hard. So it doesn't it doesn't affect me in the same way. You don't think it affects you? No, no, in the same way. In the same way. So, like when I swim my students and I beat them up, I'm just trying to help them. I just want to let them know what it feels like. I think of it like altitude. Like, I'm used to breathing at the top of the mountain. That makes They're sense. not. So I'm trying to bring them up a little bit so they can get used to that. And it's hard the whole way up. Um, but when I was in uh, California, I was, I stayed, I stayed, uh, uh, I'm friends with Michael Bisming, mm-hmm. who's a VOC fighter. I stayed at his house and he took us to Ruka, RVCA. The, mm-hmm. the and clothing it's a, line? Yeah. They have a private gym because the owner or the founder of Ruka is a black belt. Oh. He's super legit. He's awesome. He's a friend of mine now. Um, he, he has a private gym. In his factory, in in, in the, the warehouse, it's amazing. 
And I was allowed to come train and work out. And I'm just, you know, working out, I'm just heavy, hitting the heavy bag. And uh, I was going to be there for two days. And Luke Rockhold, who is who was the UFC middleweight champion, he's a strike force middleweight champion. Um, I see he's watching me hit the heavy bag. And after a couple of minutes, he walks up to me and goes, do you want to move around a little bit? And move around means like really Roll. light sparring. So that's Muay Thai. Like, yeah, we had just boxing gloves on. He would have shin pads. So it was just boxing. Okay. He wanted to just move around a little bit. We, um, and we moved around. We did like half a round mm -hmm. and the bell rang. He goes, let's go again. And I'm like, okay. And I put my mouth guard in this time because I fucking didn't have it before. And we're going. And he's being very nice in terms of how light, like how light he's hitting me for how hard he could be hitting me. Right. Um, and that was fun. Humbling, obviously, because he's really, really good. But he wasn't trying to hurt me. Right. And then I, Bisming saw that and he wanted to spar with me. And he was hitting me a little bit harder because we're more friends. Yeah. And I'm fucking sleeping in his kid's bedroom. Yeah, and <laughs> he's like, I can't hit you as hard as I yeah, want because yeah. you're staying in my kid's Basically. bedroom. Basically. And again, we're boys. So he, he's it's okay for him to hit me harder. And it was fun. Fine. I did okay. Nothing crazy. The next time I came to the gym. So that was a Tuesday. On the Thursday, as I'm getting in, I'm hearing, because Chito Vera trains there as well, who's a, a featherweight, uh, top five featherweight in the world. Okay. In the UFC. Um, and they're like, oh, he's doing sparring rounds because he's he's two weeks away from his fight. Two weeks means you're at the peak of your like shape, but you haven't started cutting weight yet. So you're, this is as best as you're going to feel right now. Oh, so he can eat what he wants still or no? He's still in a clean diet, but he's not like making himself sweat in a sauna and like restricting oh, his Oh, so diet. you're doing that before you get into... Before you do, in, get into the fight, you have to do that 24 hours before the fight. So you just lose weight? Yeah. So... I get what there, happens if you weigh too much? Then you lose. You, you're not either. If you weigh too much, you're not allowed to fight. If you weigh just a little bit too much, you lose twenty percent of your purse. What's twenty percent of your purse? Depends how much you're getting paid. If you're getting paid ten thousand dollars, twenty percent of the, you lose two thousand oh. dollars. Yeah, your purse. How much you're getting paid? It goes Shit. to the, it goes to the other fighter. You're a professional. You better fucking make weight. That's your job. So, so how hungry are they? You're ter terrible, terribly hungry. Uh, no. Yeah, because yeah, you're dehydrating yourself. It's brutal. If I knew that I was going to lose 20% of my purse, mm -hmm. I'd stop eating today. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, it's legit. mommy's so, trying to pay her bills. <laughs> so uh, I get to the gym. Cheeto needs rounds. And I'm like, I'll spar. Now, he's a UFC fighter, top five in the world, in camp for a with the biggest fight of his career. I don't train that hard anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I train six days a week, basically, but it's more in a teaching aspect. I haven't sparred hard in a couple of months, probably at this point. And I'm being thrown in and I'm like, fuck it, let's go. I'm in the cage with him. Rook has a cage. And we go. And about, because I watched him spar the round before. And I'm like, oh, they're going mediocre hard, nothing crazy. And I go around him and he hits me a couple times like, oh, you're trying to knock me out. You're trying to knock me out because we're not really training partners. You don't have to worry about my well-being. I'm not your friend. Right. I'm a free knockout for you. Right. For your confidence. Right. So we're going hard. And I'm like, okay, fuck it. I'll go hard too. And I'm going as hard as I can, but it's nowhere near as good as he is. Um, I get a couple a couple of good shots in. Uh, I, I did pretty well, but he really like pushed my nose in. And I'm pulling blood. Like I'm sucking blood into my throat so no. I, I don't pour out no. my nose. No. Um, and he lands. He's known for landing calf kicks. What happens with the calf kick, there's a nerve here, and if you deaden the nerve enough, your 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 foot stops talking to your brain, kind of. It does it stops working well. And during the round, I was fine. Went back to Bisping's place, hung out. I went to dinner with Bisping and his wife and his kids that night. Or that afternoon, like like six o'clock. And we're at dinner, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I'm like, is my fucking leg broken? No. It's I just like like a light switch. I'm like the most pain I've ever felt. No. And I'm like, huh, I think my leg is broken. And then I told Bisbee, he goes, that's hilarious. And I try to stand up to walk to the car and I almost can't. I can stand. It's not broken. But the the, the muscle just isn't working. The, the foot isn't working. No. And I hobble to the car. We go back to Bisbee's house and I just ice the shit out of it for hours. I have it elevated. I felt, I, I was able to walk the next day, but it was like That's rough. scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was rough. But again, it was very humbling. And when you spar someone like that, when you get your sh when you get the shit kicked out of you by a professional, all that means is now you can breathe at a higher altitude. That makes sense. So, so now anybody else 
that tries to push you, like, it doesn't affect you the same. You're it's immune. Like bombing. Yeah, yeah, you're immune. You're a little more like, immune. I've bombed enough. I've bombed. I'm not afraid of bombing. I'm anymore. not afraid of bombing. Yeah, and you need that 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 courage. Yeah. And it's humbling, and it transfers to the rest of your life. I'm not afraid of doing poorly on a date. I'm not afraid of a lot of things, but it's because of fighting. I know what. I know how bad it can feel. What's the worst date you've ever been on? I haven't really been on that many bad dates. Really? Yeah. I've had a couple of dates where I'm like, oh, we're not... Compatible. Not compatible, but they're not like screaming at me. Really? Nothing. I had one girl who I think was like, maybe did heroin that day or something. What do you mean? She, she was, was very sleepy. Off? She just seemed very sleepy. Or she's trying to get me in bed, actually, now that I think about it. I don't know. What was she doing? She's like, I'm tired. I want to lay down. I'm like, go lay down. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Uh, she had a belt ago. on her arm. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> sleepy. My arm is itchy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I've been really lucky. Dates, I, I don't go on dates very often. You don't? I don't like dates. Um, Why? I don't want to be in a relationship. Mm-hmm. So going on a date is a step in that direction. So mm-hmm. right now in my life, I'm like, oh, let's not go on dates. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've been, you know, knock on wood, very lucky. That's good. Yeah, very lucky. In LA, the dates are rough. I don't, Why? Well, no. I'm not gonna say I don't believe that. I just okay, think dating is bad. I don't think that the location matters that much. Well, there, yeah, the location I- influences it to a degree. I feel like fair, fair. Like in L.A., I dated. Okay, we were supposed to go on a date, and then he kept flaking, and then he sent me a gift basket. <laughs> like you did a fucking late show. <laughs> <laughs> It was a gift basket. Oh, yeah, it's very L.A. That's fucking it's very hilarious. very L.A., right? <laughs> like, it's really L.A. to send me a gift basket. Hey, here's of- an iPod Nano. Sorry <laughs> I couldn't fucking make it to the date. Here's, it was a gift basket of his CBD brand. So I think he was also trying to get me to... Like, push it? Like, pedal push it? Push his CBD brand. I'm so sorry I couldn't make it to dinner. Would you mind name dropping <laughs> my brand on your podcast? So he sends me this it's CBD. It's called Flaky <laughs> CBD. So he sends me this whole CBD kit. And it's funny because then I go to my hairdresser. I bring her one of the CBD face masks. And she's like, oh, this is a nice face mask. Um, Where'd you get it from? I tell her I got it from this dude. We were supposed to go on a date. A week later, she calls me. One of her clients brings her the same face mask from the same guy and this is what he does wow he what like a dumb move. he like matches with you flakes on you and then gives you cbd what a stupid <laughs> isn't that move. weird yeah because doesn't that immediately put a sour taste in your mouth to the brand yeah it's like hey I, I, what i do is i drive my car and i do a hit a, a hit and run and then i leave one of my CDs in the in the dashboard. <laughs> there you go. Let's check it out. Sorry, right, your car. New favorite artist, though, maybe right. New favorite artist. Fucking idiot. What a dumb bitch. Yeah. What a stupid fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, but then he was also a name dropper. He'd be oh, like, yeah. Oh yeah, that's. Oh yeah, that's... when I was in my backyard with my neighbor Kristen Wig. <laughs> Anyways, and I'd be like, what's happening? That's so funny. Yeah, okay, that's a very true. That's a very New York, LA thing. I'll give you that. That's very. Funny. I got to meet up with Usher later. Uh, can I call you back? What? Okay, sure. <laughs> What do you mean? Hey, Bob Odenkurt has a couple of <laughs> yeah. wrenches. We gotta swing by. <laughs> yeah, it was so, so weird. I do find it very funny. Someone who's name dropping like C level, like a yeah. lot, like, like yeah, Rob Schneider fucking has all my goddamn. He's got my blender. I gotta pick it up. You wanna yeah. maybe swing by? I gotta then give me a little <laughs> pussy because I made you meet Rob Schneider. Maybe <laughs> the animal himself. <laughs> fucking morons. Richard Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> no, Richard Lewis rocks. <laughs> Richard he gets Lewis. pussy. I'll give him that. Richard someone Lewis. Le- someone introduces me to Richard uh, Lewis. I'm getting them some dick. They're getting piped up for me. <laughs> Richard Lewis. Yeah. For sure. Fan. Richard Lewis with his little ponytail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> He's man. one of the only people to, to rock a ponytail in a way that it makes sense with the rest of him. I haven't seen like, him wear a ponytail. You haven't? No, I don't think so. Why do I feel like he has a ponytail? Uh, maybe, maybe you're talking about the wrong person. No, I feel like he has a ponytail on Curb. Okay, well, yeah, you're talking about the right person. I've never seen him with a ponytail. You've Richard never Lewis. seen Richard Lewis with a ponytail? Let's find him with a ponytail. Richard? Lewis ponytail. Lewis. I feel like he mostly has a ponytail. Yeah. I view him as Beethoven, yeah. is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, no pony. I mean, this there, is one there. picture. He's in like 7-Eleven. He's in 7-Eleven with a ponytail. Okay, okay, there's one picture. But like, I don't see any of him like on camera with a ponytail. That's not him. Yeah, he's got just long hair. Oh. I'll give you that there's one picture. With a ponytail. But it's him in 
life, and I don't see him that way. I only see him on TV. If you walked into 7-Eleven and you saw Richard Lewis, mm -hmm. that'd be, I think I'd be starstruck if I saw Richard Lewis in a 7-Eleven. I'd be Absolutely. like, what the fuck are you doing here? Yeah, the king himself? Are you kidding me, what King do you John? Think, what do you think he's buying? He's probably getting coffee. Coffee. And a, like a bottle of aspirin. That's what my guess is for him going in anywhere. I feel like he's got to have a bottle of aspirin on, on him at all times, and I hope that doesn't <laughs> <Yeah>. sound anti-Semitic. <laughs> he's great. Yeah, you're right. I do think he has a bottle of aspirin. Yeah. A Slim Jim. Ooh, a Slim he's a big Slim Jim <laughs> fan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He keeps one in his coat pocket. <laughs> He keeps them. He keeps a couple of them unwrapped in like an old cigarette case or a cigar case, and he opens. Like, Would you like a something? <laughs> and you're like, "Is that fucking Slim Jim?" No. Yeah, actually, yeah. It's, Richard Lewis should be the face of Slim Jim. <laughs> yeah, they really go in a different direction. <laughs> <What> They're <laughs> doing Macho Man Randy Savage for a while. I'm like, let's let's mellow them out a little bit. <laughs> Maybe you snap into a Slim Jim. Yeah, snap into a Slim Jim. <laughs> <laughs> snap and get a little protein. You probably need it. <laughs> Who doesn't need a little mechanically separated chicken now and then, now and again? Ugh. <laughs> mechanically separated. If you look at the ingredients, mechanically separated chicken is. What does that mean? It's just a machine is just fucking yanking and pulling that chicken and making it mush, and then fucking processing it and making that meat stick that people like at gas stations. There you go. Make it's not a quality product. Oh, a Slim Jim's not a quality product. It's not a handmade artisanal treat. Treat, yeah. I was gonna say meat stick. Um, but yeah, it's mechanically separated chicken, pig lips, and no cow foreskin. I don't know what the fuck else is in there. Cow foreskin. It's the worst cuts. They just kind of show. It's a. It's like it's a little below hot dog for God's sakes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that checks expecting? out. That checks it just out. shows you how far seasoning can go. Yeah, the right seasoning. Well, right seasoning. You get anything, fucking nice. Anything can taste. Nice little bite. And passable. Yeah, yeah, palatable. Palatable. There we Palatable's go. There's the, the fucking, fucking word. word. <laughs> That's the word of the episode, everybody. That is palatable. That's going to be the name of the episode. <laughs> yeah, Diego Lopez, palatable. Like, yeah. Okay. It's a bit, a bit much for him, really. <laughs> um, okay, so where can people find you? Do you want to plug your My pop? address is 6... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at this Diego Lopez. So many funny tweets. Thank you Great so much. writer. Oh my God, stop. Um, uh, I have a podcast with my best friend, Micah Brucey. He's the world's funniest person. Um, it's called A Little Time Podcast. Uh, and it's just us having a good time being best friends. We want to be best friends at you. Yeah, I just, I did it. You it did was it. so You're much great. fun. You're so funny. We had the best episode ever. People Go watch love, it. It's the number one ranked A Little Time episode so far. I do the rankings and I change them every <laughs> week. I have a sign up and I move it. It's just Sarah number one. Sarah number one in my book. That's what I say. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Thank you for coming on the pod. And thank you guys for listening to another episode of Shank. New episodes every Wednesday. Make sure to subscribe to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Sarah Weinshank. And then this bitch podcast every Monday with Kim Congdon. Kim. And we'll see you next week. Technically a student of mine. So yeah. Respect. Yes. Bye. Bye.